Some people might be here out of a devotion to the cause of health freedom in various forms, whether it's freedom from the so-called Obamacare, I hate that word, by the way, um, you know, of various other forms of health freedom. There could be people who are devoted to the Tenth Amendment to the Constitution. There could be people who are just dedicated to the principle that it's, it's better for there to be multiple power centers in society, for people to have greater voice in the regime they live under, whatever. There are all different reasons. But I want to spend my last few moments just sharing with you what my own are. And my own basically are these, are both domestic and foreign. Domestically, I've come to the conclusion that the federal government has sold us a bill of goods and they've brainwashed us into believing it. Ever since we were sitting in their crummy schools, they fed us this line that without them, we'd be totally lost, we'd be pathetic boobs, we'd all be eating poison food, we would, with all our technological advances, we wouldn't have thought of any way to, to come up with a, uh, a non-lethal sandwich. <laughs> Our kids would all be working in a mine for a dollar a day. We'd all be getting our limbs blown off because our computer monitors would be exploding. <laughs> Everybody would earn three cents an hour. Uh, there'd be no science, there'd be no art, and on and on and on, right? Everybody would be an ignoramus and this and that, right? I mean, everybody, everybody was taught this. I understand why people believe this. There's a superficial plausibility to it because you say, well, before we had a lot of government intervention, people lived in terrible conditions. Now they live in better conditions, so the one must have caused the other. That's completely illegitimate uh, uh, reasoning, and I, I think I could I try to demonstrate that in my newer book, Rollback. But the point is that if we were educated in, this is my new analogy, I, I kind of like, I'm kind of fond of, I'm very bad at analogies. I'm the anti-Peter Schiff when it comes to analogies. I'm so bad at it. He, he thinks of analogies in his sleep. You know, he could be drunk. You know, in a car accident, he's coming up with analogies. I can't think of anything. But imagine you were educated in Walmart schools, schools run and funded by Walmart. Well, the kids now, I suppose in these schools, every, every day the kid goes to this classroom, and the classroom up on the wall, it's all pictures of Walmart CEOs looking down upon the kids wisely. And the kids are taught to sing songs, oh, how great the Walmart CEOs are. And, oh, God bless the Walmart CEOs, we'd all be pathetic boobs without them. And so I mean, on and on and on, they cut out little pictures of the Walmart CEOs. And then one day a year, they get to stay home from school and meditate on the great contributions of the Walmart CEOs, whatever. Wouldn't we, in that situation, wouldn't we say, now that's a little bit creepy, you know, like, I mean, come on. I mean, maybe there were a couple of good Walmart CEOs, but I mean, I, I refuse to believe that all good things of civilization came from these people. Like, we would say that. Yet, when it's U.S. presidents up on that wall, we accept everything they tell. Oh, my gosh, heaven forbid, what kind of a caveman are you? You mean you don't want the great innovations of President so-and-so? Where would we be? We'd all be dead in a ditch and have no limbs and three cents down. I mean, it's like a mental disorder. And, and like somehow it's been taught to, I, I don't know how, it's, it's an incredible racket. It is an unbelievable racket. I mean, in a way, I almost wish I was clever enough to have thought of it. <laughs> but I would loot you people. I would loot and expropriate you people. And then to add insult to injury, I would train your kids to cheer what I'm doing. I mean, man, I mean, that is serious, serious sociopathic cleverness. How do they think of this stuff? So I don't believe it. I believe this institution has held back human progress. I believe it pits us all against each other in a civil war of everybody grabbing. And every one of us has been sucked into some kind of interest group, whether it's our occupation, or our age, or our race, or our class. Everybody wants to grab and grab and grab and grab. It's what Frederick Bastiat said. The state is the great fiction by which everyone attempts to live at the expense of everyone else. And look at where it's got. However, my last uh, section here is something that maybe not all of you are going to receive well, but, you know, I, I can't, I gotta be me, you know, okay, I gotta tell you. And the other thing, the other thing is, so, so in other words, because of this, I believe this institution is like a de-civilization agent. So at every turn, I want to try and stop it. And if this is a tool for doing it, then I'm all for it. But it's worse than that, because, you know, I, now, let me start off by saying, giving my, my right-wing credentials here. I was the vice president of the Harvard College Republicans. Now, I know you're all thinking, yeah, that's some right-wing credential. 
Wow, so you supported Walter Mondale? Great. Ah, okay, the older crowd remembers Walter Mondale. Good, that joke wasn't lost on people. Okay, my politically incorrect guide to American history is one of the best-selling books in the history of the conservative book club. I mean, like, so I'm not some left, I'm not a commie, I, I'm not a, you know, pinko or anything like that. I'm the least commie guy you'll ever meet, although there are a lot of pretty non-commie people in this room, I'll, I'll say, of course. But having said that, I also came to the conclusion that I don't believe the foreign policy either. I just don't believe them. I don't believe the word they're And I say this to people knowing, again, that some of you are going to disagree with me, but I'm telling you I'm not a leftist in any way, and I came to the conclusion that they're lying sociopaths domestically, and they don't magically transform into angelic beings when it comes to foreign policy. They're also lying to us big. Now, that's not to say that there aren't some nasty people around the world. I mean, there's no need to caricature what I'm saying. But I think back to the 1990s when I was, you know, well, younger than I am now, and, and, and I, I basically believe that, well, I'm a good little conservative, and so, you know, when, when the authorities tell me that military action is necessary, only a pink Okami would question that. <laughs> now, that was a big, big moral mistake I made, an intellectual mistake, and I'm sorry I made it. And I think back of, to the disgraceful ways I used to make up excuses for these people. They would do, commit horrific atrocities, and they would do it on the most flimsy pretext. I mean, the arguments they made for some of these wars were so transparent. I thought, how could, I, I began to think, how can a conservative, really, who's supposed to be dedicated to Western civilization and reason and on and on, be swept up in this? I mean, it's so beneath us to fall for some of this stuff. And yet I fell for it, and, and I would go around searching for corroborating evidence to support their lies. And if, if I had seen a poor Russian in the Soviet Union doing the same thing, saying, oh no, saying to his neighbors, no, 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 what Prabhupada is telling us is true. Look, I've been looking it up, and I've looked at all this evidence I found. I would have treated that person with contempt. But for some reason, when it was my looting expropriators, it was okay for me to make excuses for them and to search out corroborating evidence for arguments that they had abandoned. They themselves had they weren't even making these arguments anymore, and I was still looking for ways to defend them. And I finally just decided, and this was back in the early 1990s, uh, after the first Persian Gulf War. Now, this is a war a lot of people thought was just, nothing wrong with it, you know, Saddam's a bad guy, he's massing his troops on the Saudi border, and so on and on. <clears throat> but I remember hearing about people, hundreds of thousands of people retreating, being incinerated, and I'm being asked to have a Bob Hope special to celebrate this. Some, some backward country, some backwater, which actually by regional standards was relatively advanced, hardly. <laughs> uh, but relatively speaking, a modern healthcare system and so on and so forth. So I, I thought to myself, what's happening to me? What have I allowed this institution to do to me that I could look so callously on these poor people? I don't care that they were conscripted into an army. They were conscripted, most of them, and I don't, I don't care that the sociopaths in D.C. have told me I'm supposed to hate these people because I don't hate them. And when I saw that I was supposed to, if there had been an earthquake over there, we would all be tears and pity about it. But when they're incinerated alive, nothing. These people are human garbage. And I just decided at that point, I'm not doing this anymore. I don't believe what you people are telling me. I don't believe your phony baloney reasons for your wars, that all you care about is democracy, so that therefore you can put the Emir of Kuwait back on his throne. I mean, come on. You know, I'm not seven years old. In fact, that's an insult, because my seven-year-old is smarter than that. I have sometimes said, by the way, that I, I managed to explain to my seven-year-old what nullification meant. And it made me conclude that a panel of seven-year-olds would be better than the Supreme Court and the Federal Reserve Board put together. So let me finish, because I know I'm, I'm way, way, way over. Way, way, way over. But also, also, as the 1990s progressed, okay, so then we've got the sanctions regime on Saddam. And the UN, okay, we, all, we don't like the UN, neither do I. The UN says 500,000 children have died of malnutrition because of the, the sanctions. And then the usual response is, well, that's a phony statistic, or if Saddam hadn't spent all his money on palaces, the kids could have eaten or whatever. That's neither here nor there. The point is, US officials, Madeleine Albright and Bill Richardson, both said they did not question that figure. They said that price was worth it. They didn't say, 
The UN is lying. They didn't say this is awful. They said that price is worth it. Now, I am sorry, there is impossible for a conservative who's supposed to, who lectures the world about moral relativism to say, I mean, what? We are better than this. How can we allow ourselves to be so dehumanized that we sit here and allow ourselves to be called extremists when people who make excuses for, for the killing of half a million children to go about their business and, and we, we defend this. This is public policy. No, I can't do this. Incidentally, incidentally, Russell Kirk is considered by some to be the founder of modern American conservatism. His classic book, The Conservative Mind, is probably in like a ninth edition by now. A very significant figure. And we look at Kirk's foreign policy, it has nothing in common with the teenage laptop bombardiers who run our foreign policy today. It has nothing to do with the neocon Bill Crystal. nothing. You look, at, you look at Russell Kirk, who's a real conservative, who hasn't had his brain washed by these phonies on the radio. Kirk said that military conscription is akin to slavery. This is, a, this is the most significant conservative thinker of the 20th century. In his book, 1954, called A Program for Conservatives, he laid out a foreign policy that bears zero resemblance to the interventionism that we have now. And at the end of the Persian Gulf War, at the end of the Persian Gulf War, he said that George H.W. Bush, now this is the most significant conservative thinker of the 20th century. He said George H.W. Bush should be strung up on the White House lawn for war crimes. Was he a pinko commie, Russell Kirk? Is that what we're gonna, is that what we're reduced to? No. Now finally, therefore, my conclusion is, it is not enough to say that in Washington, we've got some bumblers and boy, they're inefficient. And there are some libertarians who sort of take that tack, that gosh, you know, government's just full of these people who, have they, they have these programs with all these crazy unintended consequences. What a bunch of jokers. I don't go for that. It's not that they're jokers. It's that they are raving sociopaths whom I don't want to have exercising any power yeah. over me. And if we at the state level if we, in our own communities, if we can't solve our problems face-to-face -face with each other without the intervention of these people, then heaven help us. The state, but especially these modern mega-states, have been a moral and material disaster. Now, being here and, of course, you know, in this type of room, there are people of all different points of view. And sometimes people wonder, you know, well, maybe there are some people on the left who are so disaffected on some critical issues that maybe they'll join with us. And in some areas, and here I am, I'm the squariest of the square, I've never smoked pot, I've never done any of this stuff, not, I, you know, i got four kids, we do all, i got a minivan, you know, I, I'm not part of this. But I feel like I have more in common with somebody like, in the 60s, a Carl Oglesby, who said that the old right, which is the right wing that I'm talking about, has been totally decimated, and the new left are in many ways morally and politically coordinate. I'm sympathetic to the new left historian William Appleman Williams, who said that the best approximation we ever came in this country to having truly humane communities was under the Articles of Confederation. Now you utter these words, you say something like that to Bill Crystal, you may as well be holding a crucifix in front of Dracula. <laughs> now, are there alliances that are possible? Maybe. I mean, I did a book that I've got out there with a friend, friend Murray Polner, and he and I disagree on almost everything, but on critical things we came together and we, we produced, I think, a nice little, little product. I don't know what types of alliances are possible. All we can do is to hold aloft the banner of justice and humanity and see who rallies to it. And no matter who joins us, fight we must. For as Ludwig von Mises said, Everyone carries a part of society on his shoulders. No one is relieved of his share of responsibility by others. And no one can find a safe way out for himself if society is sweeping toward destruction. Therefore, everyone in his own interests must thrust himself vigorously into the intellectual battle. None can stand aside with unconcern. The interest of everyone hangs on the result. Let's all stand together. Thank you very much.